Welcome, everybody. This is a very exciting afternoon. Um, we are so, so pleased to have back with us Robert Watson. Very who, weird. Oh, well. Um, whoop, who has been um, with us many times. So welcome back. And thank you for joining us on this Wednesday afternoon. Um, this has been a fabulous series that um, has been put together with Dr. Miriam klein Kasanoff. We've had our Wednesday afternoon series. Uh, this will be the fifth, um, and uh, we have one more to go next Wednesday, and then we will be putting out uh, for the month of August another series of um, lunch and learns for um, the month of August. And we just hope to continue to keep going as we are you know, in this mode of uh, virtual programming. So we thank you for your participation and support of the Miami Beach JCC. Um, it is uh, you know, some uh, difficult times that we're going through and it makes it um, you know, easier and, and more um, of a community feel to see all of your faces here. So it's really just so nice. We have 100 people here today. What a, what a fabulous thing in the middle of July. Um, so it is my pleasure today to introduce you to Robert Watson. I think many of you have heard him speak before and, uh, and know what a, what a wealth of knowledge he is, but I'd like to tell you um, some specific uh, pieces out of his long bio. Um, and uh, I will do that now. So Robert Watson is an award-winning author who has published over 40 books. And this is probably um, a little bit dated and, and he'll tell us that he now has 50 books that he's published um, and roughly 200 scholarly articles and chapters on topics in history and politics, as well as two multi-edition encyclopedia sets on the presidents and first ladies. His books have won the John Barry Book Award, the John Lyman Book Award, and the Independent Publishers Gold Medal in History and others. He's a frequent media commentator um, and has been interviewed thousands of times by news outlets around the world, including CNN, MSNBC, USA Today, The New York Times, NPR, BBC, and many, many others. Uh, Dr. Watson co-convened several national conferences on the American presidency, co-founded the annual Truman Legacy Symposium for the Truman Presidential Library, and served on the boards of numerous academic associations, community organizations, and the Harry S. Truman Foundation, which is why we have chosen to speak about Harry Truman today. He is the recipient of many awards for his contributions to the study of the presidency, election commentary, community service civics programs, and efforts to combat anti-Semitism and incivility. He was named Professor of the Year at Florida Atlantic University and his current post at Lynn University three times he has been named Professor of the Year there. And he holds a distinguished Professor of American History and Director of Project Civitas at Lynn University in Boca Raton. Um, so I could go on and on. There are many more accolades, um, but we are just so thrilled to have him with us. And I want to thank so much Dr. Miriam klein Kasanoff for bringing him to us today and to help um, fund and, and allow this program to be uh, free for all um, through the Florida Department of Education Commissioner's Task Force on Holocaust Education. So we thank them very, very much for um, funding this program today. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Miriam, who will be co-hosting um, our event. Thank, Thank you. you, Karen. And it's wonderful to see you all here. And for those of you that are supporters and donors to the Institute, this is the kind of programs that your donations have brought us that we're very proud to, uh, to bring to you. Um, I want to tell you about Robert Watson and how I reconnected with him after 25 or 30 years. Um, I watch book TV a lot. And one day, a couple of years ago, I was watching book TV and oh my God, there was this handsome professor that I said to myself, I know that face from somewhere. And sure enough, it was someone I had once taught with years ago uh, when uh, Road Scholar was Elder Hostel. So I found his email and I said, do you remember me? Because I remember you. And he said, of course I remember you. And thus we renewed our uh, friendship. And I had, uh, 
I'm going to call him Robert. I had Robert speak to my teacher institute two summers ago. And let me tell you, the teachers gave him a standing ovation. So you're really in for a big treat. And just to take 60 seconds, I'm going to ask you the question I ask everyone as a starter. If you knew that you were going to be sheltered in, what would you have made sure that you added to your shelter that you don't have? And then example I always give is, I wish I would have fixed up my patio nicely because that's the place I go to whenever I need fresh air. So what would have been your addition, Robert? I would have got my family and friends and we would have flown to New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be here. I'd be where there's no COVID. So I would have gone there. What I did do is we've been, um, Dr. Miriam, we've been sheltering and not going out except to the supermarket and we wear gloves and a mask. But I did go to Home Depot. I like to garden in my free time and we have papayas and pineapples and a tropical garden here at the house. Uh, but we always liked Giverny in France. And since we're stuck in our yard, I went and got tons of flowers and made a real big garden. So we're trying to create our own Giverny in the backyard. So that makes it a little bit more bearable. But um, That's Dr. beautiful. Miriam, <laughs> Dr. Miriam and Karen, thank you. It's good to see both of you again and work with you. And I recognize I was scrolling through the four pages here uh, and, and I recognize several of you. Thanks for joining us on Zoom. I always call Zoom the Brady Bunch channel. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't it look like the Brady Bunch? Um, right. But you know, since this uh, COVID crisis began, I have been complaining about the term social distancing. I think we should have been calling it physical distancing because now more than ever before socially, we need to be supporting one another. So kudos to Karen and Dr. Miriam for thinking of all of you and finding a way of enriching these otherwise long uh, monotonous days, right? And um, thank you for, uh, for, for thinking of everyone and all of you, thank you for joining and taking off your morning pajamas and putting on your afternoon pajamas. <laughs> From the waist down, I still have my pajamas on. <laughs> so um, with that said, uh, my hero is Harry Truman. Um, I have several heroes, but he's definitely one of them and at the top of my list. And I'd like to thank all of you, uh, think, have all of you think of the following. If you could have a dinner party from history and invite any couple of people to it, who would you bring? Uh, I would definitely invite Truman. He's always inspired me. So think of who has inspired you. Uh, and I've had the great good fortune of serving on the Truman Foundation uh, and at the Truman uh, Little White House and Home and their foundations for many, many years. And every year I make my pilgrimage to all these sites and, and I've gotten to be friends with the Truman family. And uh, I did a project several years ago. It was one of the, my favorite things I've done in my career. And that was I gathered together all the former living Truman advisors and over a three year period, I conducted extensive interviews with them, sort of like to show a foundation, right, with the oral history interviews. So what I've done from that is put some of my favorite Truman stories together for you, just about the man, about leadership, and also with his extraordinary legacy on statehood for Israel. And I'd like to share those with you. At the end, of course, I'm happy to take any questions. Let me just say that to get us started, that Truman was Born in 1884, grew up in rural Missouri, and uh, was the last president to lack a college degree. Uh, some of my favorite presidents, uh, like uh, Washington and Lincoln, and some of my heroes from history, like Alexander Hamilton and Ben Franklin, all joined Truman in lacking a college degree. Uh, yet, while they were all minimally educated from a formal sense, they were all voracious readers and were intellectually inquisitive, which I think are two signs of, of greatness. Um, the other thing about Truman that's interesting is he grew up in a racist and anti-Semitic household. If you were to take a time machine back to rural Missouri in the 1800s and meet this guy, you would not have liked him and you would have not have thought that he would amount to anything. He was in short, a product of his upbringing and environment. The Trumans were unreconstructed Confederates descended from slave owners on both sides. But one of the many reasons why I like Harry Truman so much 
is he gives us an example of an old dog who can learn new tricks. Um, he absolutely overcame his upbringing. And really, I think next to Lincoln, he would be my vote for the greatest civil rights champion in the history of the office, and maybe stands alone as the greatest champion for human rights worldwide. Clearly, when it comes to presidential legacies on Israel, there's Truman's and then everyone else since him, uh, running a distant second. So uh, when Truman grew up, he had he had two goals. He wanted to be a um, he wanted to be a uh, uh, an historian or an architect. Those were his two dream jobs. He also wanted to go to West Point. Unfortunately for Truman, uh, he came from nothing, and he was he was darn near blind. He needed glasses. He could hardly see, so he wasn't getting into West Point. He would have a chance to fulfill all those objectives, however, in the following sense. He did go in World War I. He got to be an officer. He was a captain, Battery D of the Missouri Artillery. Uh, so in World War I, he was a great hero. And I think this is a pivotal, a touchstone moment in his life because he didn't rise up high enough to be a general, uh, but he wasn't a private. So he was commanding men, but yet by just being a captain, he killed people and saw people die and developed a very mature uh, and sophisticated version, view of, arm, of, of, of serving your country in the military and of the horrors of war. So here's a cute story for you. When Truman was, uh, the problem is if you're going to be in the military, you have to pass an eye exam and he couldn't see at all. He even said during World War I, he brought about a dozen pairs of glasses along and put them in every pocket and every backpack in case if he lost his glasses. So Truman has to pass the eye exam. This is not going to work because he can't, he said that he could barely see the wall, yet alone <laughs> the eye chart when he went in. But here's the thing about Truman, which he shared with some of my other heroes like Lincoln, Hamilton, and Ben Franklin. Truman had a photographic memory. So here's what he does. He gets in line to take the eye exam and there's two younger men with him. He says, you chaps, you gents, you go first. And he let the two guys go. He stands behind them and listens to them read the eye chart, memorized it off the fly, walked in and then just memorized and gave the entire eye chart and passed the test. Um, he would have a chance to be both an historian and an architect. And that was when the White House needed a complete, a complete renovation and restoration under his presidency. Truman used to say that the White House was going to fall down. And he said, of course, I'm so unpopular, everybody will blame me. Remember, the White House was burned uh, in the War of 1812, August 24th, 1814. Uh, they added a third floor, it burned again. Uh, the, uh, the foundations were such that the old timbers, it, the, the, it was literally bowed. Truman would say that when you walked around the White House, it would creak and groan. He would laugh and say, it's haunted. Um, the chandelier would swing when he would walk. So Truman tried to build support to get the White House renovated, but they wouldn't listen to him. So what he does is he organizes, he invites key members of Congress, the architect of the Capitol, uh, and several other people of that nature to come to the White House. And he's going to show them that you can't even shut some of the doors because the foundation was warped. He was going to show them how the chandelier would swing. Uh, so he walks in, and you talk about coincidental timing. I swear he didn't set this one up. He's walking through the first floor of the White House with this, uh, these dignitaries, and there sitting on the floor in front of him is a pile of rubble, debris. It's just, you know, on the floor. It's like stones and paint and rocks. And they're looking at it thinking, what on earth? Then Truman and everybody looks up. The leg of his piano was sticking through the ceiling. <laughs> so he has the great line. He says, gentlemen, this building is standing purely by habit. So they all allocated the funding to renovate and restore the White House. And Truman got the play architect and historian. You know, he shows up every day on the construction site and drove everyone nuts. He's barking out orders. It's his house. It's the people's house. So much so that the foreman of the construction crew had to tell Truman's at AIDS, Please keep the president away. He's driving everyone nuts. You know how they have a sign out front of a building saying this is under construction? The first day when he walks on site, he sees a, he sees a sign naming the company that's redoing the White House, and he blows a gasket. 
No, that's commercialization of this building. This is a museum. It's the people's house and he demanded that they take that sign down. Now here's the problem. They build several sub levels. The White House has several basements, as, as you may know, and uh, three floors. The problem is to be able to do all this, they need to bring a bulldozer, uh, heavy construction equipment inside the building to dig all this out and put in steel girders and all that. So they're gonna have to knock down all the original walls. Truman says, no, that's history. So here's what he makes them do. They have to disassemble the bulldozer, screw by screw, nut by nut, bolt by bolt, and carry a thousand pieces through the door, reassemble it inside, do the work, then disassemble it again. I'll be darned, he was gonna save some of the walls and some of the history. And his renovation of the White House is considered extraordinary even though everybody gave him grief about his one addition to the White House. That would be the Truman balcony. They called him back porch Harry and, and made fun of it. Truman said that, you know, the building was asymmetrical and that the balcony, the Truman balcony provides the perfect symmetry as a waistline for the building. And what's interesting is the White House Historical Association always asks presidents what their favorite rooms in the building are and virtually every president who served since then said the Truman balcony in the view. So there's Harry for you. So here's a couple stories. So I interviewed from secretaries to speech writers to lawyers to aides to generals, anyone who was still alive over a multiple year period, roughly 20 years ago. And uh, here's a couple of my favorite stories for you. I interviewed Truman's secretary, one of his secretaries. Her name was Wanda. I found her in Sarasota. So I went over and she baked me a cake, which was really cute. And she wore all these Truman buttons. So um, before I interview someone in an oral history, like I said, a Holocaust, a Shoah history, uh, I like to get people to relax and just tell a story. I like to make it like an informal conversation. So I told her, tell me a story about Harry while we get ready. And this is what she said. Uh, I, she said, I wasn't Truman's main secretary, in other words, the person outside his door, but there were a group of about four of us that handled the phone calls, the scheduling, and the typing and all that. And she said, uh, I was one of them. She said, uh, uh, unlike other presidents, Truman insisted on knowing everyone that worked for him. He knew your name and treated everyone with great kindness as if you were a best friend. She said, one day I brought in a photograph of my son. I can't remember his name, let's say it was John. And this young eight-year-old boy, he put, she puts the photo on her desk. She says, Truman comes walking by one day to go to his office and he stops and he looks at me and he says, Wanda. And she said, first off, I almost fell out of my chair that he knew my name. And then he says, that's a new photograph on your desk. He noticed, who is that handsome young man? And she said, oh, Mr. President, that's my son. He says, well, what's his name? She says, it's John. He goes, well, how old's John? She said, he's eight. Well, he's not eight. He'll be eight in another nine weeks on September 5th or whatever. He says, well, okay, tell him Harry said hi. And then he laughed and went in his office. And she's thinking, that's crazy. You all know where I'm going with this story, right? Nine weeks later, on the date of John's birthday, she said, Truman is walking by. He stops and looks at her and goes like this, Wanda, Today is John's birthday, tell him that Harry said happy birthday. And then he walked into his office. That's the kind of guy he was. Treated everyone with great dignity and great respect. Here's a cute story that several Truman aides told me and some of the archivists in the library, they said one of their favorite letters was this one. So there's a man whose car breaks down. This is right after Truman's presidency, which was from uh, April 12th, 1945 to January 20th, 1953. So right after his presidency ends, this man's car breaks down near Truman's home. And of course, back then, no one had cell phones and my students have no idea what that means. Um, so he has to borrow a car. Now, uh, Truman was at his home, uh, 219 North Delaware Street in Independence, Missouri. The man comes up and knocks on the door and says, my car broke down. Could I borrow your phone to call a tow truck? And Truman says, sure, come on in. The man doesn't recognize Truman. So he makes the call, calls a tow truck, and then Truman says to him, look, it'll be a few minutes. Why don't you have a glass of iced tea with me? And he offers him a drink and sits down with him. And um, the man then finally says, look, you've been more than generous. I should be going now. 
And as the man's walking out, Truman walks to the front porch, the man's walking down the steps for the sidewalk. The man turns around and looks at him and says, you know, did anyone ever tell you, you look just like that son of a bitch, Harry Truman. <laughs> and Truman says, yeah, I get that all the time. <laughs> bye bye. And then the man leaves and uh, sometime later, the man realized, oh my goodness, that was literally the president that I said it to. So he wrote a letter apologizing and apologizing. Of course, Truman just got a kick out of it. There was another letter somewhat similar that I enjoyed. Um, they were honeymooners, a young couple. And they were sort of doing like a, a drive across the country for their honeymoon. Um, so part of it was, um, you know, like Route 66. At any rate, they, um, they stop at Truman's home. That, from today's perspective, this is unimaginable because uh, you would have a, a fence, secret service, alarms, you know, uh, lights. But back then it was just Truman's house. So they stopped and they walked up and they walked up on the front porch and they get up on the front porch and uh, the, the woman hands the husband the camera and she's pretending like she's walking into Truman's house. He's going to take a picture. She says to her horror, the front door opened and there stood the president of the United States. <laughs> she said, Truman goes, here, give me the camera. And then he has them like go in the house, sit on the swing, and he's taking pictures of them. Then he hands them the camera. And they said as they were driving away, he's out in the middle of the yard waving <laughs> goodbye like a neighbor or something. They said they were so excited to, um, to print out all these photos. But what it was, Truman never took pictures. He was a terrible photographer. He cuts their head off, <laughs> like all the photos. But they said we had a great story. Let me give you one or two more quick ones, then I'll jump into some stories about statehood for Israel. Um, you and I, all of us today on this call, irrespective of our political party affiliation, would agree with the following. Um, we all realize that campaign finance is a horrible uh, issue facing us. We need campaign finance reform. We should call it what it is, legalized bribery. So what Truman, um, Truman did is uh, in 1948, he was going to lose and lose big to Mr. Dewey. A man he always said looked like the little man on top of the wedding cake, didn't he? <laughs> he also said no one's gonna vote for Dewey because he looked like the bad guy in all those silent movies that would tie the girl down on the train tracks. At any rate, uh, Truman's aides are trying to get him to go to a $5,000 fundraiser and he won't go. So the aide tells me that he says, Mr. President, look, you don't understand. You're gonna lose big and it's $5,000. Truman says this, no, you don't understand. It's not $5,000. If I win, it's 5,000 IOUs, and I'm not for sale, and the office is not for sale. And he didn't go to the fundraiser. That, everyone, is the kind of, of leadership that we need. And he sure showed that leadership in 1948 in recognizing Israel. What's amazing about this is Truman needs to sweep the South because Dewey will win key states in the North, like New York and Pennsylvania. Uh, how is Truman going to sweep the South when he's pushing civil rights, women's issues, and aggressive program for statehood for Israel? It's Truman who is the first world leader to recognize Israel. It's Truman who fights for a, get this, a $100 million loan guarantee for the fledgling state of Israel. Uh, now, Congress, the Joint Chiefs, the State Department, everybody was opposed to this, but he fights and gets that. Truman does more. He fights to allow, get this, over 390,000 refugees from the displaced persons camps to be able to come into the U.S. Think about our view on immigration today, or quite frankly, any time. Jewish immigration was enormously unpopular at the time, yet Truman fights for over 390,000 refugees. Now, here's the kicker, two interesting stories. One, we had quotas on immigration. Only so many people could get in. The problem for Jews in DP camps in places like Cyprus and elsewhere is they were stateless. Many Jews would not go back to Germany or Russia or Poland, and who could blame them? Rightfully so, they wouldn't go back. But without being back in that country, they were not therefore eligible to come into the U.S. under the quota. So um, moreover, the State Department wanted zero, Congress wanted zero. So here's what Truman does. 
he orders his staff to find out any country who still has spots open in their immigration quotas. So let's say Greece had 500 seats still open. Truman would tell his aides, I hear that there's 500 Jewish Greeks in Cyprus or elsewhere. He had folks listed under a variety of nationalities to be brought into this country. One of his senior advisors told me he should have been impeached for doing that. I mean, it was violating the law. Now, don't get me wrong, the senior advisor was ardently in favor of saving people's lives from DP camps, but Truman was, was playing, he was gaming the system by listing Jews as countries from all over the world to try to get folks here. The second thing, a uh, story that is interesting, when Truman left office in 53, he was enormously unpopular, considered to be a failure by many, uh, no crowds, good riddance kind of a thing. Truman was depressed. Uh, Eisenhower and Mamie sat out in the limo and would not come in for the private tour and scones and tea. All outgoing presidents host the incoming president for a little, you know, meet and greet. Ike stiffed Harry and stayed out in the car. So Truman's a bit depressed. The aides are telling me that as they're walking Truman away, they're, he's, they're telling him, Mr. President, the Marshall Plan, you know, saved Western Europe, Western society and civilization. Mr. President, the Berlin airlift prevented World War III. They're trying to cheer him up. And then they say, Mr. President, because of you, countless thousands of Jews from the Holocaust are alive today and living safely in the United States. And they said, he finally said something. He sort of got out of his funk. And he says, how many? How many did we bring in? And the aides said, Mr. President, over 390,000. And they said, Truman got all sad and said, it's not enough. I could have done more. He couldn't. He had to gain the system to get folks in that he did. It's extraordinary. So Truman develops a wonderful relationship with the uh, Zionist and Israeli leaders, uh, David Ben-Gurion, uh, Dr. Chaim Weizmann, Ambassador Abba Eben. Abba Eben considers Truman to be a father figure, and the two of them have this extraordinary relationship. Uh, Eben would write and say, when he was, um, uh, when he was sent, dispatched by Ben-Gurion and Weizmann to go meet with Truman, he said that Weizmann wanted to meet with him first and said, remember, Truman is the most important person in the world because he is the one giving us the loan guarantee, recognizing Israel, uh, protecting our patents and copyrights in the UN and everything else Truman did. I'll get to all that in a moment. So uh, Weizmann says to, uh, to Ambassador Ab Eben, remember, you are going to meet with Moses. <laughs> so Ab Eben goes to meet with Truman. He says, I was so nervous. He said, I wanted to think of just the right way to introduce myself. Now, remember, everybody, Abba Eben was a first-class intellectual, you know, impeccably educated, uh, and was a, an, an orator and a rhetorician uh, of, of, of a first-rate order. So Eben goes to meet with Truman, and this is what he says. Um, he says, um, oh, Carolyn just said, Harry Truman should be considered a righteous Gentile at Yad Vashem. You know, I wonder if he is. I'm looking that up. Uh, I, I've been to Yad Vashem and actually pushed to get some people listed. I'm looking that up afterward. Thank you, Carolyn. So anyways, back to the story. So um, here's what Abba Eben says to Truman. He says, Mr. President, my country is a brand new, small and poor country. We're fledgling, we're, we're struggling. He goes, we don't have titles we can bestow on you. We cannot knight you. We cannot give you gold and great medallions, but here's what we can offer you. He goes, my people from Abraham to Moses, Noah, Jacob, Isaac, my people will never be forgotten. Their names will stand the test of time. He says then to Truman, and to that great list, we will add the name Truman. Wow. Abba Eben said, Truman looked at him and said, nah, it's just Harry. <laughs> Typical humility. Uh, but what Eben did is he used to call Truman the American Cyrus in reference to Cyrus the Great, not Darius, not Xerxes, who was insane. Cyrus the Great, the first uh, Persian king to bring Jews back to Jerusalem. Uh, so Eben and Truman had this 
wonderful working relationship. Uh, there's another story involving Eben and Truman and statehood that I always liked. So here's what it is. Um, on the eve of statehood, uh, and Truman was the first world leader, as I said, May 14th, 1948, to recognize Israel, by the way, at 6.11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> but who's counting? Um, so uh, right on the eve of statehood, there was a monkey wrench thrown into the whole system. Truman uh, decided that he wanted rabbis in the U.S., to hear from his mouth personally that he was going to recognize Israel. He's got the loan guarantees set up. Everything's going to happen. Uh, so Truman invites some of the leading rabbis to meet with him. Rabbi Stephen Wise, New York, if you know that name. Rabbi Abba Hillel Silver from Ohio, if you know that name, and so on. And I've had the great privilege in my career to go to each one of these rabbis' pulpits and speak at their temples about this and other stories involving them. So this is an important moment. Truman meets with the rabbis and he says, you've heard a lot. I want to assure you that this is going to happen. The State Department is opposed, but I have them on a short leash. The British are trying to undermine this, but I've muzzled them. Uh, the great General George Marshall was worried about this, but I have him on the sideline. We have a $100 million loan guarantee. Here's how it's going to happen. And it, so it's a courtesy call. He's not there to debate it. He says to them, I want you to go back to your congregations and tell them what I've said. Amazingly, there's a moment there. Rabbi Abba Hillel Silver is, as you know, is a is, is a great orator, influential, very charismatic, but Silver was a megalomaniac. And I said this from his pulpit, I thought a lightning bolt <laughs> was going to come down and blow me off the, the bema. <laughs> but at any rate, um, uh, so Silver's a megalomaniac, and this is what Silver does. Silver's upset that he didn't have a private audience with Truman. Silver's view is, you should have come to me. And Silver accuses Truman in this meeting of being an anti-Semite. Silver and Truman get into an argument, and Silver pounds on Truman's desk in front of everyone. Truman stands up and says, quote, unquote, no one, and I mean no one, pounds on the desk of the President of the United States, and he throws him out of the office. So the rabbis are thrown out of the office. So Silver then goes outside. And the media is there. They put a microphone in his face and Silver endorses Dewey. Now, no one can tell me that Dewey would have done one one hundredth for Israel in the larger Jewish diaspora, what Truman did. No one can say that with a straight face. Then Silver goes on a speaking tour, bad-mouthing Truman. And I'm sure you'd all agree. And I've always asked this question to uh, uh, friends of mine and folks in the Jewish community. You know, you go back. 30, 40 years, everyone loved FDR. But nobody gave Truman any love. It should be the other way around. FDR's record was reprehensible in Israel, and Truman's the father. Um, and I still think that today that part of the reason why FDR gets more credit than he deserves and Truman doesn't get enough was Silver was so effective in just slandering and bad-mouthing Truman that everybody heard this and then told their families and their friends. So here's what happens. Rabbi Stephen Wise was in the meeting. Wise is, it says that the Zionists and, and, and rabbis are panicking. They hear from Silver who says, Truman won't recognize Israel. He's going to leave us hanging. So there's a great panic in the community. Stephen Wise says, no, I was in the meeting. I believe Truman. He has everything set up. It was Silver's ego that ruined everything. So Wise says, I remember that Harry's best friend, Eddie Jacobson, is a Jew. So let's get Eddie and let's arrange a meeting with the great Dr. Uh, Chaim Weizmann. This is their first meeting. And Weizmann can assure Truman that this needs to happen. Little did they know all along, Harry was still gonna recognize Israel. He was just mad at Silver. So Stephen Wise gets Eddie, Harry's best friend, his haberdashery partner, his World War I buddy. They ran a, a supply shop in World War I together. So. Eddie goes to see Harry, and the purpose is to ask Harry to please meet with Dr. Weitzman. Harry didn't want to meet with anyone. He said, listen, I'm going to recognize Israel, but I can't have the folks I'm trying to help criticize me. Everybody's criticizing me. Everybody's endorsing Dewey. I'm done, but I'm going to do this, but I can't meet with him. So Eddie goes to see Harry, 
and Eddie says, Harry, you got to meet with, with uh, uh, Dr. Weitzman. He's uh, lived his whole life wanting this. He's an old man. He's in New York. Please, Harry. And then Eddie starts to cry. Now, Eddie happened to have been follically challenged, let's say. <laughs> so Harry puts his arm around Eddie and says, quote, unquote, all right, you old bald-headed SOB, I'll meet with him for you. So Harry meets with Dr. Weitzman. Now, it's an important meeting, but it starts off tense. Here's why. Harry has Weitzman brought in the back door because he doesn't want the press there. Because Harry says, Weitzman's going to criticize me like everyone else. Then he's going to go out and endorse Dewey. And I can't have that happen. So he sneaks Weitzman in. Weitzman thinks he's being snuck in because he's Jewish. So it's kind of a cold environment there. Weitzman brings the Torah. He wants to give a scroll to Truman as a gift. They're sitting there talking. And Weitzman's going on and on and on in this eloquent, you know, distinguished, uh, uh, you know, I present my credentials. He realizes Truman's bored. So Weitzman stops the whole ceremony and says, here, I have a gift for you. And he gives him a Torah. And Truman looks at it and says this, quote, unquote, you know, thanks for this. I've always wanted one of these. <laughs> and then Weitzman laughs, Truman laughs, and Truman breaks the ice. He says, look, why don't we just go in the back room, cut the crap, and let's talk and make sure this happens. And then in his Midwestern Missouri drawl, he seals the deal. Truman cannot pronounce Chaim. He calls him Cham. <laughs> and Weissman laughs. Truman laughs. They go back into the back room to have been a fly on the wall. We don't know what they said. Neither one wrote about it, but here's what we know. They came out arm in arm about a half an hour later. And they worked like brothers on this. It was Weissman who goes to Rabbi Silver and says, zip it. Truman's with us. He's one of us. So he made that possible uh, to put all that together. And it was a cute letter that Weitzman and Ben-Gurion sent Truman uh, later. Uh, and they're playing with him in reference to Truman getting so much grief from Silver and so many rabbis. This is what they said. In the letter, they said, you know, we don't know if you know this or not, but even though we're the leaders of only, you know, I don't know, half a million people or whatever the population of Israel was at the time, and you're the leader of 150 million or whatever the U.S. population was, we're the leader of a half a million people that all think they're the leaders. And they thought that Truman would get a big kick out of that. Uh, I interviewed one of Truman's aides who told me that when he got a letter from, Ab, uh, from um, Dr. Weitzman, um, he started to tear up and cry. And I asked the aide, well, what did the letter say? And this is what he said to Truman in the letter. Quote, unquote, generations of Jewish children yet unborn will call you father. I mean, what, what a letter, what a line. What Truman did, and I'll end with this, uh, in 48, Truman knew that this would cost him the election. Yet he thought it was the right thing to do. I had a number of aides tell me this. Truman said to them, I would rather do what's right and lose than do what's wrong and win. And I'm quite certain that's the last time any politician has ever said that. And when he met with his aides to go through this, he had everybody debate the pros and cons and all the details. And he added, as I said, joint military cooperation, joint military training, um, immigration, cultural exchanges, patent copyright protection, key vetoes in the UN. I mean, Truman did whatever Weitzman and Ben-Gurion and Eben asked him to do. But at the end, when he met with his aides to have that vote about uh, all this, Truman looked at his aides and this is what he said. Now tell me, is this the right thing to do? Because I think it's the right thing to do. And the aides started saying, yes, but the polls, yes, but no. Nope. One question, is it the right thing to do? And they all said yes. And he said, well, there it is then, then we're doing it. So that's the kind of moral courage, uh, the kind of leadership. And I think if we were to go back in history and take Truman out of the equation, I think Israel's history is, uh, looks a lot different. And it's not as wondrous as it is. I think Harry Truman they gave us the, uh, a blueprint uh, for leadership in difficult times and how to not be poll driven, but how to just simply do the right thing because it's the right thing. Thank you. Questions? Wow, that, that was wonderful. Um, 
uh, Dr. Robert. Um, just wonderful. We're all clapping, if you could see. <laughs> I think Karen, <laughs> Karen, I think, has a little anecdote to finish up uh, that she's in Key West. Tell well, us. yes, I wanted to say now I am triply inspired to head over to the Truman Annex, which is where I was earlier this morning on my morning walk. I am in Key West right now. Um, and I I'm certainly going to be going to the Little White House for a tour as you generously uh, offered to help me set that up. And, um, you know, there's so much history down here in Key West um, of Truman and, and many of the presidents who stayed at the Little White House. So that was a really um, wonderful uh, connection Karen, um, for me personally. I'll give you, uh, if you all don't mind, a very quick story about Key West. You know, Truman's home is down there. You all need to visit it. Thomas Edison, Colin Powell, Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter, uh, John Kennedy. The home was used by a who's who. Truman spent 175 days down there on 11 official, official visits. So he didn't use Camp David. He used Key West. And he loved it. He loved to go for walks. He loved to hang out. He wore Hawaiian shirts. They, had, they played volleyball. I mean, he could really kick back and be himself. He made important decisions while he was down there. But here's a one cute story for you. Um, the Naval Commandant, it's on the Naval Annex, assigned a young Naval officer to follow the President around every single hour of 175 days and write down everything he did. The director of the home a few years ago calls me, this is 15 to 20 years ago, calls me and he goes, oh my gosh, in the attic we found a box of all this, these manuscripts listing everything the president did. It was one hurricane away from being lost and history didn't know this thing was there. So that is a, uh, I mean, it's a time machine, everyone. Uh, I apologize for getting excited as an historian, but this is an intimate glimpse of everything the president did. So I went down, we got this, I got my graduate students, we got the Truman Library and we typed and digitized the whole thing. So when I brought all these living Truman aides down there for the first time about 20 years ago, and we're all sitting around Truman's card table, drinking bourbon that, like him and having a wonderful time, I told them, I said, I have a surprise for all of you. We found these boxes and it's an intimate view of everything the president did. And they were all excited. And they said, what did you learn from reading all this? And I said, I learned that Truman worked his rear end off and they all go, no, he was a workaholic in Washington, but down here he worked, but he had more fun. I said, no, he worked in the morning. He worked at night. He worked every hour. They go, no, he didn't. I said, yes, he did. It's right here in the paper. Uh, and I said, for example, so I started reading them at eight in the morning, Truman announces, okay, boys, it's time to get some work done. Saturday night at 11, okay, boys, time to get some work done. In the middle of the afternoon, time to get, and I said, this is amazing. This it, and the, the one uh, senior aide, his name was George Elsie, says, wait a minute, what did you say again? Here's what happened. Uh, Truman would tell the guys at eight in the morning or on Saturday night, okay, boys, it's time to get drunk. All right, boys, time to play some poker. All right, boys, time to open up another bottle of scotch. And this military aide says, Mr. President, I can't write that the President of the United States is cheating at cards at eight in the morning with scotch. And Truman goes, it's what I'm doing, write it down. The aide says, no, Mr. President, I can't write it. But yet the Admiral says, I need to write everything. Truman says, well, write whatever you want. So whenever Truman said, we're going to drink or play cards, he wrote down, we're going to get some work done. So <laughs> Sounds like Key West to me. <laughs> well, uh, get some work done, Karen. <laughs> so Karen is here. going to um, ask you a few questions. But I, I don't know what was going on there for a minute with me. Um, I missed... Someone asked you about somebody being righteous Gentile. Could you tell me um, um, that was in reference to? Okay, so uh, you, you all know that in Yad Vashem, uh, righteous Gentiles are listed folks who have, have served the Jewish community and saved people during the Holocaust. At the and, risk uh, of their own lives is a requirement. And, uh, you know, there was uh, my book, The Nazi Titanic, about the Holocaust. There was a... Uh, uh, one young German cadet who risked his life to, to save a lot of uh, Holocaust survivors in the water. And, and uh, we have his name, but uh, there's so little known about him because all the records were lost or yeah. classified. I tried to, uh, to see if I could get that for him, but there's not, in this, not enough r record. Now, Truman did not risk his life, per se. He risked his presidency. He risked a number of things. But the, the sheer extent of Truman's uh, good deeds. Now, there's a Truman uh, library 
in, in Israel, there's a Truman Institute. There's a forest named for Truman. Trees have been planted for Truman. And the usual gifts that Israel yeah. offer. To I just wanted to make it clear that uh, the only way you could really be nominated, and it's a huge, very complicated procedure involved, risking your life during the yeah. time of the Holocaust. So Karen, um, how, what kind of questions? Yes, I, I, I mean, I'd love to open it up to the audience to type in their questions. I, of course, um, you know, have, uh, we, you and I could probably have a conversation for hours, but I um, would love to find out from you what you're working on currently. I know you're such a prolific writer and, um, you know, we have all been, have, you know, we have a lot of time on our hands right now. So what are you working on right now? Thanks. I'll give you the 20 bucks later for that tip off. <laughs> um, so uh, I was supposed to have two books released in March, and I was way, very excited. Uh, of course, we could use the money for tuition. <laughs> but uh, both publishers decided to put the books on ice because all the book festivals where we were accepted, the book awards, the libraries, the book, everything was canceled. Uh, one book is called uh, George Washington's Final Battle. Uh, it's by Georgetown University Press. I'm very excited about it. The publisher is going to release it uh, probably December, January-ish. The other book is called The Great Escape. It's about the Civil War. It's about the largest prison break in America's history. Uh, a group of Union soldiers is sent to this wretched prison in Richmond, the heart of the Confederacy, right near where Jefferson Davis's uh, Confederate White House was, and they're being tortured, they're being beaten, the death rate is extraordinary, and they happen to capture a colonel from Pennsylvania who, just like the movie The Great Escape, he tunnels under the prison, and it's the largest prison break in American history, uh, the, one of the largest manhunts, right in the middle of the Civil War under the nose of the Confederacy in Richmond. It's a hell of a story. It's called The Great Escape. That'll probably be released around December or January also, unfortunately, they're holding off. And COVID has allowed me to knock off, uh, I, I, I'm making great progress, I'll have it done this fall, a new book on the uh, British burning the capital city. Our capital city in August of 1814 was burned to a crisp. And we didn't have a government, we didn't have a capital, we didn't have a president's house, we didn't have a uh, the actual capital building, the Library of Congress was burnt. That's the story about this. So thanks, Ken. There is a question. There was a question here from uh, somebody about why didn't Truman attend the Bermuda Conference in April 1943? Um, Truman was in the Senate at the time, uh, right. so he was not president and not till 45. Uh, Truman, his support for Israel, I, I should have, I would have said, but I, we have limited time. Is uh, it's documented as early as 1942. Um, in 1942, he gave a speech in Chicago where he called for statehood, uh, a, a state, a Jewish state. He called for righting the historic wrong of the Holocaust, and he called for Jewish immigration to save people from the Holocaust. He called the Nazis beasts, and he called out our government, which is interesting to think that FDR would then pick him in 1944. Uh, AIDS and some of his writings would suggest, as well as his relationship with uh, Eddie Jacobson, that uh, through the 30s, he was furious with what Hitler was doing and probably favored it then. But in terms of a public address as early as 1942, uh, Truman attended the big three conferences after FDR. You've all heard of Tehran and, and Yalta, and uh, he was in Potsdam with the big three. So he did attend a number of them. Um, I see Erica has a question about where do I get my information? Good. Um, so uh, I use Erica primary sources, so letters from the president, letters written to the president. I've been to the Truman Library more times than I can count. Uh, I've read, uh, I believe, every letter written between Truman and Weizmann, Truman and Abba Eben, and Truman and David Ben-Gurion. So I've read all the letters going both ways. Um, I've interviewed, oh, you know, they're all deceased now, but when they were alive, I interviewed over that three year period, every advisor to Truman. I've gone through uh, Truman's proclamation on May 14th, 1948, recognizing Israel. By the way, what's an interesting sidebar there is the State Department was so angry at Truman for doing this that here's the wording they used in the proclamation, quote unquote, the United States government hereby recognizes the de facto Jewish state. 
Truman crosses that out and writes over it in big words, big letters, Israel. Now, I think you can read into that, hereby recognizing that the fact of Jew, the fact that Jewish state would have worked, but Israel's better. It adds something to it. So I've read the actual proclamations, the letters. Uh, so presidential libraries, Erica, are a repository of all of his speeches, writings, memoranda, all that. So it's, uh, and Truman was a, something of a pack rat. Uh, he kept everything. Uh, more so than most any other president. So we have more information, just volumes on him than almost any other president. And secondly, Truman was so brutally honest that he gives us the good, the bad, and the ugly. So he tells us about all the mistakes he made. Um, for example, one of the things the aides told me, I asked them, do you ever see him laugh? Do you ever see him cry? Do you ever make him mad? Uh, did he ever tell you an off-color joke? I mean, that's the fun stuff, right? And in fact, here's Truman's favorite joke. They all said, oh gosh, he always told us this joke. He used to say, politicians are the worst people and politics is the worst business. So here's his joke. He used to say, don't tell my mother I'm in politics because she thinks I play the piano in a whorehouse. <laughs> That's preferable. That's preferable. Um, and, and when I asked them, did you ever see him cry? Two aides told me when he read letters from Weizmann, he cried. That's how committed he was uh, to all this. But, you know, um, so we have this just incredible resource of letters and, and firsthand recollections that we can read. So Erica, there's a lot of info out there. Uh, oh, one last thing I was meant to say. So I asked the aides, did you, ever, did you ever get mad at Truman? Did he frustrate you? And they all said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's what a lot of them told me. He would make a mistake and he would tell us, look, I made a mistake, I have to tell the public. And they would say, no, you don't, no one knows. You know, blame it on someone. No, I, I, I made a mistake, I have to tell them. They'd say, Mr. President, you're gonna suffer from this. People don't know, let's just move on. No, I got it. So they said they would be so frustrated that he was almost naive, he was so honest, that he would accept responsibility for things he didn't do and, and accept blame for his AIDS mistakes and tell the public everything. So, yeah. So we have a few more questions. Um... Um, Adrian asks about um, a story that um, 1,000 Jewish people boarded a bus to take them to the Canadian border. Is this a story that you know about? And can you clarify why this happened, that they had to leave the United States to then come back in? And what was Truman's role and, and why? I've heard of this story. I have not researched it. So let me say that. It's not one of the stories I've written about, researched, or gone through all the primary source records. I've heard it from other scholars and from the library staff. Apparently it was a snafu in their immigration status. As you heard me say a moment ago, Truman brought in over 390,000 Jews, uh, refugees from the Holocaust and DP camps, and most of them were brought in illegally. Uh, there was a, it was a sensitive issue. Uh, some of them ran afoul of some of the documents. So what folks had to do was go to Canada, go to Mexico, go to Argentina, and then resubmit and he made sure that they were brought back in. So there was a lot of third party end arounds on all this. And again, these aides, the one aide in particular was involved in this. And he said, you know, I always thought Truman was gonna be impeached, but we did it because it was the right thing to do. I'll give you an example of this kind of end around on behalf of Israel. Um, the $100 million loan guarantee for Israel. Um, Congress has strings attached. Uh, they can't spend it Israel cannot spend it on weaponry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Truman has this back and forth with Ben-Gurion where he's saying, listen, spend it as you see fit, wink. In other words, Truman's telling him, look, do what you feel you need to do on this. I'll hold off Congress. And then he gets, um, he gets uh, uh, the State Department comes to meet Truman and they said, some members of Congress have raised this concern. We understand that the Israelis are using this money to buy weaponry, you know, and in 48 and 49, that's what they needed to do. And that was against the agreement. Truman said, oh, I'm sure they're not, but I'll take a look at this. They, the State Department said, we have evidence. So Truman, this is what he says. All right, this is so important and such a violation that I'm gonna take this away from the State Department and Congress and we're gonna deal with it in the executive office of the president. Then he writes a letter to uh, Feitzman and Ben Gurion. He says, I put it in my desk and locked the desk, the letter. In other words, he sat on it. 
so that they could continue to use the money as need be. So these are some of the things that- Dr. Robert, um, one of our guests from New York, a dear friend of mine, Patty Kenner, says she has an answer to something. I'm not quite sure which it is. If Karen wants to- Oh, let's see, her. Patricia, there. Have at it. I'm, I'm a collector of stories and I know this is a sharp audience, so have uh, at it. It's Patty Kenner. We're so honored to always have her at our lectures. She's a tremendous supporter of Israel and a fabulous lady. Um, Thank you, Ms. Kenner, for what you've done. Thank you. Yeah, please have at me, Ms. Kenner. So here's my answer. I made, I was close friends with a woman named Dr. Ruth Gruber. Do you know who she is? Ruth Gruber worked for Harold Dickey's. She brought a thousand refugees from a hol the Holocaust to a camp in Oswego, New York. And they made a deal. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt and Miss Eleanor Morgenthau and Ruth went to FDR and said, you must allow these refugees to come. This is gonna be a terrible slur on our State Department if America saves no refugees. Oh, you, you were muted, Ms. Kenner. So, okay, there you, okay, you're unmuted. You're good now, go ahead. Oh, it's muted again. So try clicking your unmute again to see if you can get that unmuted. There, now you're, you're live, okay. I'm okay? Yeah. yeah. Each each refugee signed an agreement. Um, Ruth brought Icky's arranged for 1,000 refugees to go from Italy to a camp in Oswego, New York. Each one of them agreed and signed that they would not stay in America. They would go back to their country. Obviously, after the war, they couldn't go back to their country. Ruth went to FDR and said, what are we going to, went to Truman, Truman and yeah. said, what are we going to do? And he said, we'll bus them to Canada, okay. then we'll let them come back into America. That's the answer to that woman's question. Isn't that extraordinary, Miss Kenner? Thank you for sharing that. I had I a, it was an immigration snafu and they had to go to Canada and he could bring them back in. So they're- Exactly. There, Cross the T's and dotted the I's for us. Right. And there's one more comment I wanted to make. Did you see a documentary film that Eddie Jacobson's daughter just made? It is absolutely beautiful, telling all about her father's friendship with Harry Truman. And at the end, when, of course, I was in tears saying, I'm sorry, my darling, I have no money to leave you, but I spent so much money going to the White House to visit Harry Truman. It was very important that I can't leave you anything in my will. Yeah, I had the great, thank you, Ms. Kenner. I had the great honor uh, of, of becoming friends with uh, Eddie Jacobson's other daughter, Gloria Schusterman. You all probably know the Schusterman name from all the the philanthropy that they provided in Israel and elsewhere. So Gloria and I did a number of programs together where she would talk about Eddie and I talk about Harry and we would do public programs. She also showed me uh, one of the pens Truman used to recognize Israel, he gave to Eddie. Uh, Eddie was seven years Harry's junior and sort of like the little brother in this big brother, little brother friendship. Uh, after their haberdashery went bankrupt, Eddie couldn't pay his bills. Harry covered Eddie's bills for him. So they were, they were very close. And Gloria, Eddie's daughter, would tell me she remembers Harry coming over to the house and them sitting around and it, like, it was, like it was nothing uh, in these conversations. So Eddie Jacobson was a great man. Oh, and there's one other neat one that Eddie wrote about. Um, a, uh, a Hillel uh, was, was naming itself after Eddie. Um, so and Eddie, unfortunately, didn't live a long life. Um, Eddie asked Harry if he would come along to the dedication, and Harry really insisted on doing it. So they go to the dedication, and Eddie says when they're reading what Harry and Eddie had done, Eddie said Harry was crying again. So I like to bring this out because we have, we've had this vision of Truman as this contrary Missouri mule. This was a man with great empathy. This was a man who was fully invested in statehood, and, you know, Eddie described you know, looking over at Harry and him just crying like a baby when uh, they were reading off everything he did. Uh, Miss Kenner, those are great stories. I see there's one here about Bess. 
from Bobby Kaufman. Yeah, as much as Harry is my hero, I've never liked Bess. <laughs> so I always tell my friends, look, if there's a heaven, I know Harry's there. I'm not sure if Bess is going to make it in. But uh, if I make it, listen, you got to go talk to Bess to get her away from me so I can sit down and talk to Harry. But um, Bess Truman was a product of her environment. Her um, mother, Madge Wallace, was an anti-Semite and a racist. And um, when she gave the Trumans the keys to their home on independent, in independence, she said no black or no Jew will ever be allowed in. And that's not the word she used, by the way. Um, so she was horrible about her, her views. We do have a letter from Harry and Bess where Harry writes to Bess and says, listen, hasn't it been long enough? In other words, he wants to bring his friends that are Jewish. There was a black Tuskegee Airman named Herman Johnson that Harry was friends with. He wanted to bring into the house. Bess writes back and says, no, we have to live in this town. So um, uh, we never defend Bess, uh, but Harry's record was extraordinary. Uh, Harry struggled with Bess's mother. Uh, gentlemen, Truman had the misfortune of having a mother-in-law who lived long. <laughs> Um, at once at dinner, I have a he wrote that they're at dinner and um, Madge wouldn't let Harry sit at the head of the table. I remember my grandpa, my dad, back in the day, that was like some old sexist thing. The man always had to sit at the head of the table. Madge sat at the head of the table. Harry wrote that, uh, that uh, Madge, Mama Wallace, as he called her, looked at the salt and pepper was sitting in front of Truman, looked at Truman, then looked at Bess and said, quote unquote, Elizabeth darling, would you have Mr. Truman pass the salt and pepper? She wouldn't even talk to him. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of bigotry on the extended family, which I think even speaks more volumes to the fact that Truman was able to open up his heart and just change his perspective. And we should all take a lesson from that. Um, and that is, um, don't just talk to the converted. Don't ever give up on people. Keep talking to them. You know, thank God Eddie stayed with Harry and Harry had such an array of Jewish friends that who knows how history would have been different. Uh, let me get this one here before we call it. Uh, Robert, I just wanted to note because the Institute is sponsoring this, the Holocaust Institute, that we have um, a survivor friend that uh, we have two Holocaust survivors on that I know of. Oh. Uh, so I like to give a shout out to them. Lajlo Selleck uh, was saved by Raul Wallenberg. He's on yeah. from Hungary. And recently through Karen, I met a brand new author named Eva Moremi, who wrote a book that just came out called Hidden Recipes. And when I heard she was from Czechoslovakia, I just took a chance, emailed her and said, are you from Kosice, where I was from? And she said, yes. And we have become fast new friends. And I'm just so excited that she's on and she just wrote in. Excellent program. Thank you, Miriam. And we have about five or six uh, two Gs, uh, Ruth Gordon and uh, Barbara Goldstein and uh, quite a few that are adult children of Holocaust survivors. And one of the reasons that I'm always honored to have Patty Kenner on is she's a huge supporter of Holocaust survivors. So uh, since the Institute is uh, paying you, <laughs> we wanna make sure that our Institute people know that uh, this is um, where your money goes and your donations to bring people. Are you gonna promise to come do another lecture for us maybe in August when Karen and I continue this? I see people nodding their heads, so say yes. Of course I would. Uh, and with that, we also had a question from someone way at the beginning asking, where are you gonna be teaching this fall? And what does that look like for you, You know, both on the university level as well as on the community level? Okay, I'll answer that. And just let me say to the two survivors and the children of, I'm honored to meet you. Um, and I've done some fundraising for Next Generation who uh, works with children of survivors. And every semester uh, for the three decade career that I've been a professor, I bring Holocaust survivors and World War II vets to my campus to talk to my students. It's a transformational opportunity. So I'm going to email Dr. Miriam and Karen to see if maybe any of the children of or survivors would be willing once we get back to normal or by Zoom to perhaps talk to my students. I'm always 
looking for uh, groups of folks to talk to the students. Uh, this fall, I'm, I'm back at the university. I'm at Lynn University, which is in Boca. Uh, and we're, you know, we're still working out the details, whether we'll be by Zoom or live or some hybrid or, you know, all schools have a big challenge in front of them. And Lynn's, I think, doing a good job trying to fix that. Uh, I would be honored to come back. I enjoyed when I did a program for Karen before and for Dr. Miriam before. So, of course, I also lecture regularly for a group called One Day University. It's out of New York City. And now mm -hmm. the programs are on Zoom. I've done probably 40 of them in 40 different cities around the country, but now it's on Zoom. I do have a question I want to answer here. Someone said, why did Truman, why was he so supportive of Israel? Um, of course, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, reading about this, asking everybody about it. It's a couple of things. Uh, one is World War I. Truman goes in World War I, and as you heard me say, he was a captain, not a general. So he's in the thick of it. He's heroic. He, has people, he kills people. He sees people die. He leads men. He was in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, which is one of the most pivotal and worst uh, aspects of World War I. So Truman comes back from World War I, and it's a different man. He's writing that he's seen the evil that men can do. And he writes that, you know, I'm going to dedicate the rest of my life to championing the people who need a champion. Anyone who needs it, any injustice, and, and he does. Um, secondly, his relationship with Eddie Jacobson and a large number of Jewish friends. Uh, he has an extraordinary array. In fact, his, the number of Jewish advisors that he hires uh, was extraordinary. The great judge, uh, Sam Rosenman considered one of the greatest presidential speech writers in history, was one of Truman's speech writers and good friends and aides. So Truman has an extraordinary array of folks around him who over the years of their relationships really helped move Truman's heart to where it needed to be. Thirdly, Truman loved the Old Testament. He was not religious, rather skeptical and agnostic. In fact, he once said, uh, one of my mottos is, I never trust a Baptist. <laughs> but... Um, which is one of my mottos too. But um, at any rate, so Truman loved the Old Testament and he loved the sweeping historical narrative. Therefore, when he met with uh, Ambassador Abba Eben, he says to Eben, I know all about the couple thousand years of the persecution, but I also know about the promise. And then Eben wrote that Truman just ticks off in fact, Eben writes to Dr. Weitzman and says, this man knows more about our history than I know. So Truman was immersed in that. And how do you not read that and not be moved by it? I always say in my own life as an historian, how do I not embrace fighting against anti-Semitic violence? How do I not embrace learning about the Holocaust just as an historian? Never mind my heart. But, uh, and, but the fourth and finally, he can't tangibly study this, but this, was, this has been my theory and I've said it for 30 years. With Truman, what you find is FDR was the master chess player. Everybody was a piece on that chessboard and therefore you were expendable if you were a knight or, you know. With Truman, uh, Truman viewed everything as, is it the right thing to do? With Truman, when you had to make a decision, he would reach down inside himself and find his moral compass. And if it was the right or moral thing to do, he was dogged, tenacious. He was immovable. He could not, he did not let go. So when it came to moral issues like civil rights, Truman wanted what would be the later be the 64 Civil Rights Act. He wanted that in the 40s, but he was defeated by Republicans and Dixiecrats, um, Southern Democrats. Uh, so what Truman does is he passes Executive Order 9981. He desegregates the military. He would not be stopped. So with Israel, what you see is uh, with the joint military training and, and, and intelligence sharing and, and support of Israeli patents, you've all heard of most favored nation status. The U.S. gives MFN to other countries to help them with trade. Truman starts this with Israel. In 48 and 49, the world is boycotting Israel. No one will sell to, no one will buy from. So Truman greenlights, streamlines, and creates an early precedent of like a most, most favored nation status to help Israel's economy. But uh, so I think all those other reasons, we know they've been written about. My theory on why he did this is because it was simple. <laughs> and it's the right thing to do, so there we go. Uh, Karen, I think we're reaching the end of our time, unfortunately. 
I, I do want to do a shout out uh, to Elisa Stein. You remember Lisa, Robert. Elisa is our assistant to the Institute and without her, we would not be able to do all these connections and everything that we do. So Karen, did you want to wind up the program then? Yes, I just want to say thank you all for spending your afternoon with us. It's been, I know that there have been people that um, weren't able to come in. We did have a 100 person limit, a uh, good problem to have to solve for the future, but we had, you know, that limitation on us today. So for anyone who was unable to come in, we do have the recorded, um, um, events, you know, we, we did record the event, so we will be sending that out and everybody will have an opportunity to view it um, later on. So um, thank you so much for, for being here and you are amongst the lucky ones that were able to get in. We hope that you will join us again next week. We have Bea Hines from the Miami Herald who will be um, with us um, talking about her experience as um, an African-American here in Miami Beach. Um, and um, Mer Dr. Miriam klein will be with us again for that program and it, it will be a, a very interesting conversation. So um, yeah, please Bea do. was the uh, first African-American woman journalist to be on the Miami Herald. And uh, Robert, I'm gonna be coming after you to give us another lecture in August. Well, you don't say no to Dr. Miriam. That's what, <laughs> that's what everybody says. Hey, I was told years ago, always say yes to Bubbies. So it's been <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, we're definitely going to have you back. And I can't thank you enough for agreeing to do this for us. And I wish everybody only health, happiness, love, and peace. Because that's all I want at this point. Great way to end. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.